You may be seated. Good morning. In the February issue of Life and Work, uh, copies of which are in your pews, there is a prayer which ends, and may we know you at the core, changing, making all things new, God in every end and new beginning. Last week, we were at the end of one chapter in the life of this congregation with the departure of our former minister, the Reverend Barry Dunsmore and his wife, Hilda. Today, we turn the page on a new chapter with the arrival of the Reverend Norman Hutchison, who has been appointed our locum minister for the next five weeks as we begin preparations to search for Barry's replacement. It is my great pleasure to welcome Reverend Hutchison and his wife Elizabeth to Bermuda and to Christ Church. Reverend Hutchison was ordained in the ministry, to the ministry in July 1973 and went on to be minister at St. Andrew's Kirkcaldy until 1988. He was then appointed minister at Dalbidi of Ur, where he stayed until his retirement in 2013. After, quote unquote, retiring, he served as locum minister at St. Andrew's Church in Sri Lanka for several months. Reverend Hutchison has always been keenly interested in reducing the environmental impact of churches and individuals, both in Scotland and internationally. <clears throat> he has convened committees of the World Mission Council, Education for the Ministry Council, ecumenical organizations in Scotland, and the World Exchange Program, sending volunteers abroad. Norman and Elizabeth have two daughters and live in the southwest of Scotland, where they enjoy their grandparent duties for their two and a half year old granddaughter. We hope they will enjoy their time in Bermuda and that the weather will continue to improve while they're here. <laughs> May God bless us as we start down the path to a new beginning. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Yeah, and delighted to say that I'm here and to be with you, as you heard, for the next five weeks. Dunk, uh, Derek will be taking over for us as your full-time interim moderator then, but he, there was this gap when he needed to be in Fingerola in Spain, so I drew the best straw by being invited to come to Bermuda. So I've had, we arrived on Thursday night and um, I've been amazed at the hospitality and the warmth of you as a congregation and you as people here in Bermuda. So we look forward to the, the five Lenten weeks as they will be as we share a variety of thoughts. You'll hear each week a, a different and hopefully a different engagement with something about Lent, something about Jesus, and more importantly, something about our role in the world that God has made and the commission that is given to us as Christian people. So we will share hopefully together a number of different thoughts over these five weeks. The psalmist, and we will hear a little bit more of his work later on as we link this to the readings we hear from the lectionary for this particular Sunday, the first Sunday in Lent. The psalmist said, the earth and everything in it belongs to the Lord. The world and all its people belong to him. Who is this glorious king? He is the Lord, the all-powerful. We worship God together in our opening hymn, which is 153. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. 153.
Let all the earth acclaim God, sing to the glory of his name. Come and see what God has done. Let the sound of his praise be heard. Blessed is God, who has not withdrawn from us his love and his care. You may be seated. Let us pray. Eternal God, in the beauty of the day, in the quietness of this house of God, we gather. We gather surrounded by the good things of earth. We gather surrounded by the energy that the food of the earth provides for us. The animal stock across the world, the grains, the pulses, the fruits, the fishes of the seas and the birds of the air, from which we receive protein, and energy and carbohydrate. And for all that you have made and made available to us, we praise the name of our God. For the resources of the planet, energy that is drawn and extracted from the earth, that grant to us warmth and cool air in our homes, our offices, and our churches, and our businesses, that create the energy by which massive industrial processes follow. We give you thanks for all the resources of the earth. We give you thanks, eternal God, for all that is granted to us to make our lives meaningful, comfortable, and well. Forgive us, we ask, if we take the resources of your earth for granted. Forgive us if we take what we are given and turn it into a right. Forgive us if we forget our obligations to what you have made. Forgive us if our hearts have not been warmed to ensure that there is justice for all, that there is peace and human security, that there is food and safe water for all. And so, Lord, we who are receivers and recipients of great and wonderful gifts, gifts of God from the planet we call earth. We ask that we may rise in our hearts to be a people of compassion for the earth, people of justice, people with concern. This prayer is offered to you, our Father, in the name of Christ, our Savior, who loved the world so much, this world so much, that he came and died for it and offer to his disciples a prayer that echoes across the millennia. As we say together, the prayer is printed on our order of service bulletin. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Right, now an address to Christchurch youth. Okay, guys and girls, do you want to come up and join me for a few moments here at the front? Great stuff. Oh, fantastic. I was, going to wonder, I was wondering where you would stand or sit. Because I'm going to sit as well because I'm towering over you. I mean, look at some of you guys. You don't even make it to my ankles. <laughs> and I don't like looking down at you. So you folks are get the disembodied voice of yours truly. So I'm going to sit with them for a wee while. Because it's story time here in Christ Church. And I need a little bit of help for this story because we have four letters which are going to appear lots of times in our stories. And every time you hear them, you have to say them. Okay? So the first letter is I. You say that? Second one is C. Third one is B. And the fourth one is B. Okay? So let's say I, C, B, B. You got that? Okay. Once upon a time, this little Scottish boy called Wee Jimmy 
And wee Jimmy was sound asleep in his bed. It was Friday night going on to Saturday morning. And wee Jimmy liked nothing better than his game of football. And in his dream, and he didn't know it was a dream, he thought he woke up and he looked at his clock. And he thought, I'm late, I'm late. I'm supposed to be playing football with my, with my friend Sandy. I'm late, I'm late. And he leapt out his bed and he yelled, Mum, Mum, I'm late. Mum, are you, where are you? Mum, where's my trousers? Mum, where's my football gear? Mum, Mum. And from the bed, Mum's bed, was a sleepy wee voice that said, I see B B. Wee Jimmy thought, what's that? Never mind. So he grabbed his shirt and knew what it was. It was lying in the corner of his bedroom where he dropped it the night before. Found his trousers. They were crumpled under the bed. Found his socks. They were rolled up inside his shoes. So he pulled them all on. Found a not very clean pair of underwear and a vest and a shirt. And he grabbed his gear and he rushed out the house. And his last question was, Mum, Mum, where's my breakfast? And she said, I see B B. That's funny. So anyway, he rushed round to Sandy's house. And it was all the curtains were down. There was nobody stirring in Sandy's house. No lights on. So he rang the doorbell. And nobody came. And he hit the door, bang, 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 and nobody came. And then he did something which you don't do. You picked up a stone and he threw it at Sandy's bedroom window. So a minute or two later, the window opened and a little tired face looked out. And wee Jimmy said, are you coming to play football? And Sandy said, Oh, that's funny, said we Jimmy, that's very strange. But he wandered on down to the football park. And there was a sign outside the gate that said, No football today. I see B B. And we Jimmy was really struggling with this when he heard a voice that said, Jimmy, time to get up, time to get up. And he said, Mum, I've had the most amazing dream. And what did I tell you all about it? And he said, I went and I saw wee Jimmy, I saw Sandy, and I heard you, and everybody was saying the same thing. They were saying, oh, Okay, said Mum, that's very interesting. Anyway, off you go. It was Sunday morning, in fact. He thought it was Saturday that morning in his dream, but it was Sunday morning. He was doing what you're doing. He went to church. And there he heard a story. It was a story that Jesus told. And Jesus told the story of a great king who was having a big special feast, a wedding feast. And he invited all his friends to come to this special feast. And they all said, yes, dear king, we will come to your special feast. Lovely. But on the day of the great feast, he sent a servant out and said, find out if the first one's coming. And he sent a message back and said, no, I've got a new tractor and I'm going to be busy plowing up a field. So, I, and he went to another one, and he said, no, I can't come today because, and we, Jimmy, was listening to this, and he thought, that's the same phrase that I heard, but nobody told him what it meant, and he went home, and he said to his mum at lunchtime, it's funny, had the same letters, I, in my dream, and then I heard about it at church. What does it all mean? And mum looked at him in the way that mums look at little boys, and she said, Jimmy, go and tidy your bedroom. It's an awful mess. And he said, I can't be bothered. I see B B. So the message of the story of Jesus and story of little Jimmy's dream is that we've all got to be bothered. Now I think you say a wee prayer together, don't you, at this point? Yeah. 
Well, what's the wee prayer? What's the I always do at home? So I'm going to say two or three words, and you say them after me, okay? Heavenly Father, help us to be bothered when people ask us to do something. Amen. Okay. Now, we've got a song about creation, which is behind me here. We're all going to sing it together. I'll give you the words. And it's number 226 in, your, in, the, in the books for the rest of you. God whose farm is all creation. Could you pass those out for me? Could you pass those out for me as well, thanks? You pass those out as well. And yeah, you take a few. You take a few. Just pass them. Okay, sorry. You take, just pass them out to people. Congregation can be seated. Yep. Okay. Thanks very much. Did you go out to Sunday school now? Yep. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Our first lesson is from the beginning of the Bible, the book of Genesis. You'll find this on page 7. It's Genesis chapter 9, verses 8 to 17. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as come out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. We turn now to the Psalms. We'll be reading from Psalm 25, verses 1 to 10, and you'll find this on page 502. To 
To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do, let, do not let my enemies exult over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, and for they, for they have been from of old. I do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for your goodness' sake, O God. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees.
Let, let us hear the words of the gospel. It's from Mark chapter 1, and it's verses 9 through 15. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Amen, and to God be the glory. And we worship God in our next hymn, 214, New, New, New Every Morning is the Love, 214. May the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts be found acceptable to you, O God. Amen. <coughs> the story of Noah, the story of God promising there would never be an end to the world destroyed by a flood, is an ancient story of God's people. We live in a different age, and I don't need to remind you that we are surprised sometimes by the changes in weather and climate patterns, which is what I'm going to propose to look at on this particular Sunday, the first Sunday of Lent. What is it about us as Christians that ought to be concerned? 
re-examining, because that is the purpose of the Lenten experience, re-examining ourselves in the light of the Christian gospel and not just in the light of what is our tradition. We'll come back to that in a moment. I opened the service deliberately with the words of the psalmist. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. And as our service has progressed, we have gone through a prayer that if you were were following it, would be focusing on creation. The children's talk about being bothered, how easy it is for us all to slide on any subject into a kind of virtual apathy. So the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Creation is, in theological terms, a world in which we live and move and have our existence. It is also our practical experience. It's from energy that we, from creation, that we take the energy that will either warm or cool our homes or builds our homes. It is from there that we get food and vegetables and root crops and uh, pulses and meats and flour that actually fuel our bodies for the daily existence. And from creation we get the hydration, the water that falls on the earth by which we as individuals are hydrated and the earth is fertilized. And it's from creation that we get the building blocks of our industrial society, the materials that build our houses, our churches, that build our manufacturing processes and our offices. And from the biodiversity of creation, we receive plants that can give us healing, correcting illnesses in the body. And it's from creation that we get the very air that we're, we're each of us breathing in and out this morning. And as I said, from creation we get the raw materials from which economic prosperity is actually derived. And the psalmist reminds us, as in fact the Gospels will remind us too, that the earth is the Lord's, as is the inhabited world. A situation that sadly we've probably over centuries taken very much for granted. As the world became urbanized and more remote, for example, from the food chain, even in a rural area from what, such as where I came from, there were children who honestly, genuinely believed that chicken or mince or beef came from Tesco's and came in a plastic packet. The fact that the, there were cows all around us and sheep all around us, they never made the connection between that stock, animal stock in the fields and food on the table. It is that divorce, and that's in a rural area. It's even worse in urban areas. It means that the, plan, the planet has endured massive climate change, or so we are now being told by the government, Intergovernmental Council on Climate Change, that the, the world itself is, is changing as a result of human activity. But that's not where I want to begin. I actually want to begin and stay with where we as Christians derive our understanding of the earth and the world. And it was Olin Smith writing way back in 1967 that actually blamed the Christian churches, and particularly those of like ourselves who come out of their Reformed and Calvinist traditions, for taking the resources of the earth for granted. That we as Christian people read the book of Genesis where we were told we could have dominion over the planet. And we took dominion to mean exploitation. And from that has derived, argued Smith, much of the problems of our present time, laid firmly at the door of the Christian churches. What we need in Lent, as we think about what we may have to change in ourselves, that the demands of creation is something that we have to respond to. There is a danger in the churches, and I've met many who have felt this way, that the current climate change was but a good excuse for the end of the world to be ushered in and that Jesus will return. I'm going to stick my neck over the parapet here and say I don't think that is what God wants us to do, to do nothing waiting 
for the end of time itself. Now I'm going to dive out into archaeology, which I've got a little bit of interest in, not that much. But I'm fascinated on some of the archaeology programs on our, on our public service broadcasting in Britain. Though they do these um, new archaeological sites. You know, they're not always sure where they're going to look. Now remember that archaeological sites in Britain can be 2,000 years old. They can actually be slightly older than that, but you can certainly find, for example, remains of Roman activity going back 2,000 years. They're constantly unearthing Viking remains. So that's 1,000 years ago. And what they're doing in archaeological terms is they've got these wee helicopters, these wee drone things that are operated a bit like a pad for your Xbox. And you know, you're familiar with that, yeah. And um, they're flying them over not at a tremendously high height. You can do it from a plane as well. And they take photographs of the ground. And when you look at the ground, even though that ground has been plowed over for 2,000 years, you will actually be able to quite clearly see the marks of the old foundations of towns or walls or, or bathrooms or whatever was there, or small outposts of, for soldiers or whatever it is. The ground, the earth, never forgets in spite of intensive agriculture for two millennia, an aerial photograph will reveal to the trained eye what uh, has happened there long since, and may even have happened in different time periods when original building material has been reused. The earth, what I'm suggesting here on the basis of archaeology, does not forget. The wound on the earth is recalled for all time. And that's the challenge for Christians of the 21st century about healing the injuries of the past and building a strong foundation for the future. Now, in the psalmist, Psalm 24, he uses two distinct words for the world. The first one he uses is the word gay, and the, uh, using the Greek version here, he uses the word gay. This is the word we get geology from, the ology study of J, the earth, or gay, the earth. And that is the physical plant on which you and I are standing and moving around. The second word he uses, the inhabited world, is the word ecumenos. Now, we don't really have many words. Ecumenical is the only word I can think of. But it has the notion of it's derived from the house. Oikos is a house. So it's a domestic level vision. So on the one hand, he said, the earth, physical, planet, with all its resources, and the inhabited world, the world that you and I have in relationship and homes and so on. And this story was set in the days of the psalmist for the enthronement of the king. And the king would come in, or it could be God, it could be read either way, it could be a, a hymn of praise to the creator or a hymn of the ascent of the king. It really matters very, one, very little. It's important that it's a hymn of elevation, a hymn of worship, and the the world is part of that, is the, of that worship, as is the inhabited world. So with those two words, an important word is here is the oikos word, for us for a moment, when Jesus came to earth. The Gospel of St. John tells us he dwelt with us. Now the beauty of that word is it's lost in, in, in translation. In its original meaning was Jesus came and pitched his tent among us. Not just had a house, because that can have all kind of overtones of size and wealth and so on. He pitched his tent. He was one with the people all around him. And you don't get much privacy in a campsite. Trust me, I know. Um, uh, you don't get that much privacy with canvas walls or skin walls. So Jesus is intimately connected with the world, with a tent. That's where he stays. And that's where he will move on from. It's the intimacy of household living, the squabbles that are heard next door, the cooking smells that will waft around. It is that kind of, of closeness, of community, that sense of being linked to all that is going on around us. Jesus is there in the middle of the campsite, sharing the ablution block, the communal food area, and the rest areas. That is where Jesus is, and that is where he calls us to be today. Our Savior in his arrival 
was there in the ordinary things of the world, caring for them and shaping them. And where are many of our young people at, and those of you who are going to read your February copy of Life and Work, will find uh, an article which I found quite interesting. It's about the new atheists. Uh, new atheism, and I'm speaking here from, from this article, new atheism is a phenomenon in the Western world. It's largely engaged, engaged with by young, intelligent student types as they reject all the traditional teachings of the church and have moved into this world of atheism. Now, when you read the article, if you do, you'll find there's a number of big hitter names, um, some of whose work I've read and not been that impressed. But um, the print and broadcast and, and, uh, and electronic media are filled with all these prophetic and apocalyptic visions of the end of the world. And young people are engaging with those. And they are concerned about them. Because this is a world where they are pitching their tent. And they are looking, if they do, at the churches who unfortunately are not saying very much about it at all. And so, in Lent, on this one Sunday, we're going to think, what maybe we can do to be bothered about planet Earth, about those who share in the household of the people of, on Earth, who share the resources of the planet. There's obligations that follow because the price of this environmental concern is actually not that easy and it's incredibly complex to know which way to go. I speak with a little bit of training in economics from way back, but you watch prosperity can so easily be reduced if you concentrate only on environmental issues. Poverty can increase, but at the same time, um, the world, I was in India just a, two or three weeks ago at a conference, and their concerns are about water. There is not enough safe water. They said, equivalent of three jumbo jets of under fives die every day in India through polluted water. That's simple. The industrial processes have fouled the rivers. So incidentally, by their own confession, have their own eating habits and toilet habits. But the fact is that every day, 1,200 children under five die in India. That is a, an issue for those of us who live in the household of God's people. And justice and food, food, security, food security have become a dominant issue in our world. And so instead of man having dominion over the earth, the call of the earth has become dominant. And it demands a response, I think, that acknowledges that Jesus pitched his tent among us. He was that close. And he shared our common life and that we must now share the earth with those whose tents are planted around us. Being Christ-like is inhabiting the land while recognizing that we are sharing that with the whole household of the inhabited world. I am not suggesting this is easy. I'm suggesting it is something that we can be bothered about, something on this first Sunday of Lent, when we remember that God promised he would not destroy the world again, but we, as mankind, are getting perilously close to doing it for ourselves. Bishop, Archbishop Tutu of South Africa wrote these words. Earth and air and water are your creation, and the web of life is yours. Have mercy upon us in the face of climate chaos. Help us to be keepers of the earth to simplify our lives, to reduce our uses of energy, to share the resources you have given us, to raise our voices for justice, and to bear the cost of change. And on the first Sunday of Lent, we simply challenge ourselves. What can we do that we are doing now that we need no longer do or can do differently and live simply so that others ultimately might simply live. Amen. May God add his blessing to this meditation 
on his word, and to his name be the praise and the glory. Amen. We continue our worship now in our offering, our offering for the ongoing life and work of the church will now be uplifted. Let us pray. Blessed God, the gifts of earth, and from the skills you have granted to us, we give these gifts to you today. And we pray that you will use them, blessing and enriching the lives of many, enabling others to follow you. For Jesus' sake. Amen. I'm going to highlight just a few of the notices that are in the order of service um, and a couple that aren't. Uh, firstly, the beautiful flowers in church today are given to the glory of God and in memory of Bill Black from his family. And the other arrangement is given in memory of their mothers from Mary Ellen Ewells and Martha Kirkland. Just to let Reverend Hutchison know, we don't always have this okay. beautiful an arrangement, no, <laughs> array uh, of flowers, but very, very um, they're very good every week, but yeah. we don't have the quantity usually. <laughs> uh, the other notice that is not in your order of service is that finally the free will offering envelopes are here. I've had quite a saga getting them. They've been on the island since the end of November, but I wasn't advised until a couple of weeks ago. Anyway, uh, they are in Thorburn Hall, so please feel free, if you prefer that way of, of giving, um, to take any um, box of envelopes. The deadline for submission for the Easter newsletter is February the 28th, so please, uh, if you have anything that you would like to have included, um, Greg Smith would be happy to get it. There's also a little uh, guest book for the uh, Barry and Hilda in, in the Thorburn Hall on the little table. There was such a crush of people last week after the 11 o'clock service that some of you may not have seen it, and uh, I thought it would be good to have this opportunity for you to sign it before I send it next week. On February 24th, this coming Tuesday, we have uh, the first Lenten service, which will be at the Rehoboth Church of God at 7.30 p.m. The Congregational Board will meet in the West Hall on Thursday at 7.30 p.m. And next Sunday, the Outreach Ministry will have a soup and sandwich lunch in aid of their outreach programs and especially for purchasing school uniforms 
for those in need. The Mad Music and Drama Group having a, a pub night. Sounds like a lot of fun. On March the 14th, and tickets are available after the service today from any of the members, from Jeff or um, any of the members of the MAD group, and I will have some in the office next week. And I think those are all the notices. Please uh, read the rest of them in, uh, when you have a chance. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Our hymn together is 159. Lord, for the years your love has kept and guided, urged and inspired us. Hymn 159. Please be seated as we come for our prayers of thanksgiving and our prayers for others. Let us pray. Merciful God, we are grateful for all that has enriched our lives, for the skills of our hands and our eyes, of our brains and our heart, the strength of our bodies, for the work that we have been granted to do 
for the influence we've been able to make on this, your planet here below. For all the faith and the people of faith that have shaped us along the journey of our lives, today we give you thanks for all that we have received and for all that we will continue to receive. Lord, in a quiet place, we remember those who are in our circle of friends and family, people we've known over the years. And there's someone on our heart today, someone facing surgery, recovering from surgery, treatment, somebody for whom these days are more difficult than others that have been before. And so because they're in our hearts, and this is a difficult time for them, in a silent place of our hearts, we name them before you now. And we ask you, God, to grant them strength in places of illness, hope in places of darkness, joy in places of sorrow. And for those who are known to us, merciful God, in silence, we offer their name to you, that you might strengthen them by your blessing and our love here today. We remember that there are many for whom this is a time of joy, an engagement, a wedding, a new addition to the family, a new job, new opportunities, challenge of new courses at university or college, the opportunity to travel. There are folk today in the circle of known to us who are enjoying this moment in their lives. And as we rejoice with them, merciful God who loves all that you have made, we pray in the silent place of our hearts for those known to us for whom this is a time of joy. And our prayer is that their joy might be increased as we name them and ask you to bless them with your blessing and our love here below. And we name them in silence before you now. And as we this day have been thinking of creation, we pray for your church. We pray for your church and its various and multifaceted organizations that seek to bring a Christian understanding of care for creation. We pray for those in theological faculties seeking to develop a theology that is honest and transparent, one that gives and accords to each and every individual on the planet a place of dignity, a place of opportunity. And we think of the many agencies and organizations, some at the forefront of changing minds and changing attitudes, and those who are at the forefront of picking up the mess, where, where water is impure and food is rare, where drugs are not available and sickness is prevalent, where climate has changed the land, where land is no longer fertile, where land is eroded and the life is difficult. So for those agencies and for those who are engaging in your world to bring hope to where there is little hope, to change attitudes where attitudes need changed, in this place today, we ask the blessing of Almighty God that all things will be done according to your most holy will, offering life and hope and opportunity to all the inhabited world. Lord, for thanksgiving, for those we have named in the silence of our heart, and for this spoken prayer, it is offered to you in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who loved this world so much that he came and died and rose again for it. Lord, hear our prayer. Let our cry come unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. And so we come together for our final hymn this morning, 512, to God 
be the glory, great things he has done, so loved he the world. Hymn 512. <laughs> Now go into God's world to love and to serve the Lord. May the blessing of God the Creator and the love of Jesus the Saviour and the strength of the Holy Spirit be with you all today through the coming week. May that blessing remain in your hearts forevermore.